This is part of a series of talks on the zermelo frenkel axioms of set theory and will be about the axiom of extensionality. So what this says is that two sets A and B are equal if and only if they have the same elements. Um, so the, the reason why this is called the axiom of extensionality relates uh, is related to the difference between an intentional and an extensional definition. So suppose I define the following three sets. First of all, I could have the, the, the set of primes that are the sum of two squares. Or I could define a set to be the primes of the form 4n plus 1 or 4n plus 2. Or I could define it to be the set of primes 2, 5, 13, 17, and so on. Now these two are intentional definitions. You sort of say what properties the things have. Um, this is almost an extensional definition. So an extensional definition means you just list all the elements satisfying the definition. So I define it to be the set of primes in the following list. Um, you notice I haven't actually this isn't quite an extensional definition because I haven't actually listed all the primes um, in, 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 in one of these sets. I've only listed about four of them. So um, strictly speaking, it's not extensional. Um, and what I really ought to do to have an extensional definition is continue this list so it's infinitely long. And whether you're allowed to do that or not is a, is a sort of slightly tricky philosophical question. Anyway. And from the point of view of the axiom of extensionality, these, are all the, these three definitions are all the same set because they all have the same elements. Um, an alternative viewpoint would be that these two are different definitions and are different objects which happen to have the same set of elements. So if you didn't have the axiom of extensionality, then these two sets might actually be different sets. Um, to explain this a bit more, suppose I look at the following two functions. I might take the function 2x plus 2 or the function 2 times x plus 1. Um, now you can um, define a function in an extensional way by having it as the set of all pairs n to n plus 2. And this is the same as the set of all pairs n to n plus 1. So, so um, if you think of a function as being a set of ordered pairs, these would be the same function. On the other hand, you could also argue that these are actually different functions. So if, for example, um, you try and implement these two functions on a computer, you would actually find the um, machine code instructions for computing these two functions are different. In one case, you're multiplying by 2 and then adding 2. And in the other case, you have an instruction to add 1 and then multiply by 2. So whether or not these are the same function or not sort of depends a bit on exactly what you mean by a function. Um, so this can actually make a big difference. For example, if you have a function for sorting a set into order, you could have a bubble sort function or the quick sort function. And from the point of view of extensionality, these are the same function. Um, um, if you actually implement them, there are huge differences. That, you know, the bubble sort function is really slow and quick sort is really fast. So a computer scientist would definitely count these as being different functions, no matter what the set theorist said. Um, so what can you what, what what effect does the axiom of extensionality have? Well, um, first of all, it means that sets like A, A, B is the same as the set of elements A, B. And this is the same as the set of elements B, A. In other words, it doesn't matter what order you put elements in the set in. And it doesn't matter if you list um, um, some items several times. Um, may become clearer to explain what extensionality does if, if you look at what happens without it. So suppose we try and develop set theory without the action of extensional extensionality. Well, first of all, we can get multi-sets. So um, a multi-set is sort of like a set, except you allow several copies of the same element. For instance, we might ask, what are the primes... What are the prime factors of 60? Well, you might want to say the prime factors of 60 are 2, 2, 3, and 5, because you know you get two copies of the 2 when you factorize 60 into primes. Um, well, in or 
ordinary set theory, this is actually the same as 2, 3, 5, but there are cases when it might be more convenient to somehow keep track of how many copies of the prime factors there are. Um, another thing you can do is ordered sets. So if you drop the axiom of extensionality, then you might find that the um, you, you, you might find that sets of some sort of ordering. So the set of a b would not be equal to b a in general. Um, so this would be giving you something. This is actually a useful concept in set theory. It's called an ordered pair, and it's usually denoted by something like this. So um, in set theory, we don't have this, but instead we have ordered pairs uh, uh, depend on the order. Um, uh, third, you, you, you can have things called atoms, or sometimes called er elements, which are sets with, well, they're, they're not sets, they're, they're things with no elements. So in particular, the empty set has no elements, but you might also allow some other things to have no elements. For instance, in the, in the early days of set theory, people would sometimes consider the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, to be primitive things that didn't have elements, but you, you, you sort of incorporate them into the, the definition of um, um, set theory. So um, what you would do is you would start with a set of um, atoms or er elements, U, and then you would take the power set of u and the power set of the power set of that and then you would sort of continue this transfinitely and build up a sort of model of set theory which satisfies all the axioms of zermelo frenkel set theory except the axiom of extensionality. Um, and um, it was fairly soon discovered that multi-sets, ordered sets and atoms aren't really necessary because you can encode them into set satisfying extensionality. For, for instance, a multi-set would just be a function from a set to cardinal numbers. So that allows you to have several copies of a set because that's given by the, the, the cardinality of its image. Um, ordered pairs can be encoded as sets in several ways. Um, the most common one is just to say that the set AB is the set consisting of the set A together with this, with a pair AB, and there are there are several variations of this. Um, atoms can be done in several ways. Um, for example, um, one common way of encoding the natural numbers as atoms is you just say naught to be the empty set. One is the set containing zero. 2 is the set containing 0, 1, and in general n you encode as the set 0, 1 up to n minus 1. Um, that's not the only way of doing it. Uh, there are several other ways. For example, you, you, you could just encode n as being um, the, the, the set whose only element is n minus 1. I think this was actually um, more common in the early days, but nowadays we usually encode integers like this. It's a bit more convenient. Um, atoms, incidentally, are sometimes useful in weaker set theories, like um, there are things called Kripke Platek set theory, which uh, where, where you remove several of the atoms, and for these, it, sorry, where you remove several of the axioms, and for these, it is sometimes useful to allow atoms. Um, we can also ask, um, why don't we just drop the axiom of extensionality? So what we could do is, why not? define two sets to be equal if they have the same elements. So this, I mean, you know, this sort of looks at first sight as if we could, you know, dispense with one atom. Um, well, this is, this is okay. It's fine to do this. There's only one little problem. We need to check the properties of equality. So first of all, we need to check that it's an equivalence relation. In other words, it has to be transitive, symmetric, and reflexative. So that means that A equals B, B equals C implies A equals C, and this says A equals B implies B equals A, and this says that A equals A. And these are all okay. 
you can you can check that this definition does indeed have the property uh, have the usual properties of an equivalence relation well the other property of equality means that um, if a equals b we can substitute um, a for b um, and again there, there are some cases where, where, where this is okay so if c is in a then we can substitute um, a and b so this implies that c is in b so that's also okay but there's another version of this we want we want to say that if a is in c then b is in c and this doesn't follow from our definition of um, equality here we, we said that a and b are the same if they have the same elements but that doesn't mean they're that that doesn't automatically imply that that, that they're that they're in the in the same set so we need this as extra as an extra axiom so we can um, drop the axiom of extensionality by defining a equals b to, to force the axiom of extensionality to be true but this doesn't really save us anything because we then discover that we that, that, that we need another axiom just to make sure that equality has all the properties of equality we want um, in general there are several different ways to handle equality um, so first of all we can take equality as part of the underlying logic so in, instead of taking equality as being something we write axioms for we, we assume we're working in some sort of first order logic which already has equality built in um, secondly we can define a equals b if a and b ha, um, are in the same sets um, um, so if you think of a set as being a collection of things with some property this would be like saying a is equal to b if and only if a and b have the same properties and this was sometimes used as a definition of equality by philosophers and thirdly you, 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 you could use extensionality where um, we can define a to be equal to b if a and b have the same elements Um, and fourthly, we, we, we could think of A equals B as an abbreviation for um, item 2 or item 3. So, so we would not really have a symbol for equality at all. Um, um, whenever we, 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 we saw a formula with A equals B, we would know this is just an abbreviation for some formula expressing definition 2 or definition 3. Um, all of these different ways of handling equality are in some sense equivalent. You can easily switch from one to the other and none of them appear to be particularly uh, any more simple or any more complicated than any of the others. Um, so um, the, the axiom of extensionality um, can also be, uh, we can also think what it, what it means in terms of trees. If you, if you think of a set as being a tree, so... Um, you remember we can think of a set as being some sort of tree like this so if, if, if a set a consists of elements a b c and so on then you can think of it as being a tree whose um, um, who, who, who's where, where, where the root is joined to more trees representing a b c and so on and then what extensionality says says that this tree is um, rigid at least if it's well founded um, so we'll be discussing well foundedness later so what this means it is it has no automorphisms i should point out this tree is actually a rooted tree so for example if i have a set containing two elements this one and this one then there are other trees um, then, then there are other trees you can write down containing the same two elements. But since um, um, you can get from this tree to this tree just by sort of 
there's an isomorphism from this tree to this tree. On the other hand, there's no non-trivial isomorphism from this tree to itself. Um, so, for example, if you had a set that looks like this, then there would be an, an isomorphism from this rooted tree to itself because you could swap, swap this bit with this bit. But this would correspond to a, a set with two copies of the same element. So, so if, if this was A and this was B, this would also be B. So this would kind of correspond to the set A, B, B. So extensionality in terms of rooted trees, well, well-founded rooted trees, just says that the rooted tree has no non-trivial automorphisms. OK, so next lecture, I'll be discussing the axiom of foundation, which says, roughly speaking, that sets are well-founded under um, the inclusion relation.